world leader in, in business jets now. Uh, they started uh, fairly recently, a very successful story. Um, and uh, they uh, implemented a critical chain on uh, the maintenance of their jets. Um, I'm not going to have the opportunity to describe how critical chain works. Uh, there are other videos and stuff where we'll, we'll, we'll do that. So you just have to, if I if I intrigue you with what critical chain is, have a look, and you'll see it's it's quite simple. Anyway, they implemented this, this different way of managing projects and, and uh, operations called critical chain. Um, and uh, not only uh, they they also did a number of other improvements, but the the. the the guideline, the, the, the main decision was to implement critical chain and uh, as a result the uh, times they took to do their, their uh, operations uh, shrank by 50%, it was uh, divided by two. Uh, for instance a check C or a 96 month check uh, which used to take 10 weeks, took 5 weeks and all the other kinds of uh, large uh, operations of maintenance uh, were also divided by two. Okay. The other very surprising and uh, rather nice thing was that the uh, labor productivity of all the mechanics increased by 45 percent simultaneously okay which obviously had a very big impact on the financial performance of the, the organization okay uh, as i said not just critical chain there was better sequencing of tasks people did focus on the critical chain sequence uh, and once again we implemented an equivalent of stop starting and start finishing as i say uh, first, a uh, plane would be finished uh, before trying to bring a new one in, uh, so that uh, people could concentrate on, on uh, one plane at a time, uh, or a couple of three planes at a time in this case, and uh, s limit significantly multitasking and changes in priority and all that stuff. Okay. Um, the second uh, example is uh, from a very large uh, industrial company with over 300,000 people uh, and this is just one of its factories. Uh, it's uh, engineering to order and make to order of gearboxes, but big gearboxes the size of uh, larger than a car and slightly smaller than a bus. Um, these gearboxes go between, for instance, uh, a gas turbine and an electric generator and a power station. Uh, so we're talking about gearboxes that cost 50,000 to 500,000 euro. Uh, they're made, there, there are no two uh, gearboxes the same, so we're basically talking about uh, one, one at a time manufacturing, uh, no repetition. A big batch for them was, was three identical units, but it was very rare. And uh, these things are, you know, an engineer's uh, dream. They have to go around at uh, 20,000 RPM for 25 years and, and not wear down or not break down, of course, and all this sort of thing. Anyway, these, these, this, that was the product. The analysis of the company quite simply showed that the bottleneck of the company was in the design office, the people who designed these gearboxes, uh, since all of them had to be designed specifically for a given um, application. And uh, in this, so we had a look at this, this bottleneck, this uh, department with 15 people, and it became fairly uh, obvious uh, that uh, it was a, a madhouse uh, being killed by multitasking. We actually measured it, as we, we quite often measure it just to, to, to underline to, to what extent it's got out of control. And the people in this uh, design office were changing tasks at least 50 to 60 times a day. That's to say that they're they were spending between five and seven minutes on a given task before switching to something else, right? Which, if you can imagine, trying to design these complex uh, products with uh, tight tolerances and uh, complex bill of materials and all that stuff, is just not a good way to work, right? And it was leading to a lot of inefficiency, a lot of quality problems, and a very poor working environment. Uh, quality of life was, was poor, people had been leaving, it was bad, okay? but. Uh, quite often design offices that are working on portfolios get into that state. Anyway, so that was the starting point and we wanted to give it up. We implemented uh, something called start finishing and stop starting or stop starting and start finishing which was uh, the orders kept coming in but uh, we uh, forbid the design office to start on them. They had to finish the uh, designs that were already in uh, the system. Okay. And since they had 50 weeks of design work in there, 
and they started working on the stuff that was nearly finished. In fact, in doing this, on getting them to, 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 to force themselves to finish work before starting something new, for a few weeks, uh, they actually multiplied by over six the output of the design office. Anyway, as things cleared up and work in progress went down, uh, multitasking dropped, and uh, the, the average a few months later uh, was a uh, tripling times three increase in the throughput and the productivity of this bottleneck and uh, it reduced the lead times which were initially 50 weeks 50 to eight weeks uh, and uh, right now they're working on six weeks and expecting to, 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 to hit, hit six weeks soon and go even further down okay um, so that's that's what they did and there were lots of other good stuff that happened uh, we worked also on the, the, the factory on the manufacturing of these parts we worked on the supplier uh, supply chain because as they speeded it up uh, they found that they had some suppliers that couldn't keep up as their lead time shrank and they went much faster and uh well there we are uh, and this was that much more impressive that this organization was heavily dependent on, on the oil and gas industry and at the time when we had been uh, that was a, a very depressed market and so uh, once again the factory was uh, had already done some uh, some unemployment and uh, headcount reduction before we started this, but uh, boosting the performance as they did uh, meant that they got back onto uh, an even keel and they started growing again and uh, everything's everything's fine now. Even though several of their competitors have gone bankrupt since. Change of uh, scenery once again. Uh, this where uh, go down to South Africa. Aero uh, uh, Aerosud. Uh, 700 people in, uh, in, in South Africa, uh, already a, a company converted to Theo Constraints and had been using Theo Constraints for many years before I, I met them, uh, in production in particular with very good performance. And uh, they had previously unsuccessfully tried to implement critical chain in their product development, but uh, they, they asked us to, 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 to try again and so we implemented critical chain on uh, new product development. And well, uh, to go to the punchline, within two and a half years, right, it wasn't immediate, but within two and a half years, they got to a stage where they were finishing their new product development 98.7% of the time on time, right, which I don't know, I haven't got any other figures to, to, to say, I'm you know, certainly in my experience that's a, a world record and, and by quite a long way, right. And this is the real world, right? Their clients are Boeing, are uh, Airbus and so forth, right? Clients do change their mind at the very last moment and all that stuff, they're in the real world. And yet they get this unbelievable uh, performance of finishing nearly all their new product developments on time, right? Uh, that's why I wanted to talk about it. Uh, and for those who know a little critical chain, if you look at that fever chart, you can see that you know, we are in the real world, right? It wasn't, it wasn't an easy, uh, life. Uh, some of those zigzags show that they had quite a few problems that they had to solve, but they solved them. Um, they also, of course, managed the flow through the system better, uh, watching out and managing uh, capacity constraints in their in their portfolio, and all the classics of, uh, of critical chain. They loved uh, they now love critical chain so much that they've decided to implement it on any project that they would run. And so, for instance, since they've implemented on the, a new version of an ERP that had to be implemented. They've used critical chain when they built a new building and so forth and so forth. So they're, they're, any project now is run with uh, with critical chain and well, they've got converted to it and you can see the results like that, who wouldn't be? Um, next example, uh, luxury industry, well, leader in uh, luxury goods uh, and um, they the very very high performance company, uh, very huge growth and uh, very good financial results. Uh, wanted to implement uh, the uh, critical chain in their product development because this part of their business uh, was in fact turning itself in from a product or a production factory into a design factory. As I say, they were making a lot of products designed to order for a particular client who said, "I want it just like this. I want this added. I want that, and so forth." Um, and that plus the uh, renewal of uh, all, all the different products that was uh, getting faster and faster year by year meant that the, the, the key challenge was no longer producing the things, it was actually 
uh, managing all the designs, the hundreds of designs a year that they had to manage. And so we uh, did a quick analysis very quickly. It appeared that they had a bad bottleneck. What do I mean by bad? A, a regrettable one, one which when you see it, you say, oh, that's silly, let's get rid of it. In an organization of uh, uh, over 300 people, just one person, uh, whose job was to create the bill of materials and uh, when we went to look, there was a huge pile of work uh, waiting in front of this person. That was the bottleneck. Uh, in fact, we, we started implementing critical chain uh, after the ho summer holidays. The diagnostic was just before the summer holidays. So we came back six weeks later, and of course, they dealt with that and that got rid of that uh, bottleneck. And in fact, we went through several iterations of identifying the bottleneck, opening it up, getting to the next bottleneck and stuff, with the result uh, that the overall flow and productivity was tripled uh, in this organization uh, as they did that. Okay, so that's for those who don't know the five focusing steps, except it's in accelerated mode. We do one, identify, two, better exploit, and five, we switch because the bottleneck's gone somewhere else. And so we go back to one. Okay, one, two, five, one, two, five. We do that quite often. It's sort of high speed, getting rid of all the bad bottlenecks. And um, so that's it, and of course the whip production uh, was minus 60% in, in 4 weeks, minus 80% in 23 weeks. Uh, the overall throughput and productivity is way above 150% right now, and it continues to improve year by year. They are a remarkable company. Um, this one is, is uh, it's not far away from the other factory, uh, both in, in northern Paris. This one is in Les Mureaux, obviously, which in, in France is where, where the the rocket industry is all, all based. Uh, in 2017, the production of the Ariane 5 rocket, right, this is before Ariane 6, at the end of the life of Ariane 5, uh, orders were going up for Ariane 5, and they had to ramp up production from six tanks. They make the tanks for the Ariane rocket, right, the, the big can in the middle, uh, from six, per t six a year to eight per year, and that was their challenge. Uh, we had a look, uh, and the bottleneck here was their welding machine. I can't show you a photo of that welding machine because it's unique in the world. It's their competitive edge because it, indeed it must weld together that uh, that tank, which is five meters in diameter, very thin aluminium, and of course those welds have to be uh, perfect, uh, and so it's very high tech welding, right? More precisely, uh, the production operation was to weld. Uh, you welded. Uh, circularly as you put the different units together and then you inspected it with uh, x-rays okay so you produced you welded and then you uh, did an x-ray and the x-ray was done by the quality department and so the utilization of this welding machine was production quality production quality production quality and they were wasting a lot of time uh, switching from one organization to the other so we implemented a, a mascot uh, that's that thing you can see uh, down down there that little uh, a very simple thing uh, that was carried around from wherever the bottleneck was. That's to say, it was either next to the welding machine when it was being welded on, and when the test, when the, the, the they were test looking and interpreting the results of the X-rays, which was uh, a bit further down in that same building, uh, that sign would would uh, travel over there, so people knew wherever they saw the sign. Please do not interrupt. This is the bottleneck operation. Okay. That and a few other things led to uh, uh, them meeting their target, 25% uh, increase, so getting to hitting eight. And they, by the way, also did successive bottleneck uh, elimination. You can have a video, you have a look at the video, their regular video by um, Christine Joffre that summarizes the, the, the entire thing in, in, in 40 minutes. Okay. This next one uh, I particularly like. It's back, in fact, to the first uh, factory I showed, uh, part of the Safran group. We'd implemented the theory constraints uh, in production. We'd implemented the critical chain in the product and in the development and industrialization in that factory. And sitting in, back, in the back of one of our classes when we were teaching critical chain, there was the uh, maintenance manager. Because uh, I didn't know at the time, but he considered he had a project to run too, and so he wondered if he could use critical chain. And so, well, uh, he did. Uh, basically, he decided to use critical chain for his project. His project was to move 45 of the 57 machines of the factory uh, to different locations, because since we'd reduced the work in progress so significantly, 
in the factory, right? And since, like many factories, machines have basically been installed where there was room at the time when we bought them, and there was a sort of spaghetti mess of flow in the system. Now the, the factory was looking a lot healthier, and you can actually see the machines again, and there was space. They decided they should move the machines more intelligently and bring them together to form a family of products and all that sort of stuff, right? Things that are fairly obvious in operational excellence. Anyway, so they had to do this. And uh, he did a first plan, a uh, traditional way, and it would, he estimated it would take eight weeks. He went to his boss, the boss said, I can't close my factory for eight weeks. So he came back and said, can I do it you know, two, four weeks? And he said, no, I can't do that. Anyway, there was a long discussion. And little by little, it got to the stage where he had a plan where he could do it in two weeks. This didn't just come out you know, like that. He, he had a look each time, how could I go faster so that he increased the number of cherry pickers so they could do more wiring simultaneously. He did that, did this and did that. And he got to a uh, forecasted duration of two weeks, and his boss said, yes, let's do it, off you go. You can do it week 50 and 51. What? Yes, 50 and 51, that's to say with Christmas in the middle of one week and New Year in the middle of the other. So you've got eight days left. Anyway, off he went, and he did it. Uh, he actually managed to move 45 of the, uh, you know, basically moved nearly all the machines in the factory in six and a half days. They finished one and a half day early. Okay. Have a look at the video, uh, you won't believe me because I'm a horrible consultant, but have a look at the video done by, by the people from Safran. Uh, people don't often exceed my expectations, but if somebody told me you could change over all those 45 machines in, in six and a half days, I would never have believed it. But, uh, they did it. Uh, beautiful story. Um, this one, a uh, European leader in um, designing and making satellites came to us. Uh, because there was a very important strategic uh, defense satellite that was running extremely late and they wanted to know if we could get it finished on time because there was very important strategic and financial reasons to get it finished on time and uh, so we had a look and indeed uh, the first calculation showed we were going to finish very late uh, but we worked at it uh, using the, the critical chain approach and uh, managed to more than uh, re reduced by a factor of more than two uh, the duration uh, of the end of the project since we were, we were called in right at the end and it finished just on time uh, a day a day and a half or two earlier i think it was a bit of a tight fit that one but uh, that was it and by the way that one i put in because so many projects like that, people get into micromanagement. Uh, that satellite had, I believe, 5,000, certainly more than 3,000 tasks in the, in the work breakdown structure, right? And they were trying to manage uh, that many tasks, and it was not possible. Uh, so uh, one of the things we did was we were implementing uh, critical chain was to simplify the model and get it down to about 200 tasks, uh, and that was something that was manageable. Anyway. Um, the next one, uh, it turns out to be very topical, of course, because uh, it's uh, medical devices that, that diagnose respiratory infections. Uh, in fact, we started in, in March of the last year, 2019, uh, working on the development of machines that uh, did diagnostics for respiratory diseases. Okay. Um, and we implemented the critical chain then, and it all went fine. As you can see, yet another nice example of a, um, a development right in the fever charts. Uh, this thing here shows that you know, there were problems. Um, but it all went well, and the product was uh, developed. And then, of course, uh, COVID happened, and uh, so they had to quickly adapt uh, the, the testing machine so it could also include in its uh, analysis um, COVID-19. They've done that, and uh, so that's our implication with regards to the COVID situation right now is uh, heavily in, in uh, the diagnostic uh, domain, trying to get more and more diagnostic machines and, and cartridges and stuff produced in the world. Um, uh, so you know that